who are the best coach quarterback duos in the NFL entering 2024. What's going on, football fans? It's Mitch back here with another NFL rankings video. And in this video, ranking every single coach quarterback combination in the NFL from the worst, number 32, to the best, the number one combination in the sport entering 2024. If that sounds good, Gronk, spike the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for more NFL BLV rankings just like this and get in the comments and let me know your opinion on my list. Ranking every quarterback coach duo. The quarterback, the coach, the core of any great NFL team. This ranking is perhaps the most important ranking of any ranking I will make all offseason long because without a great combination at coach and quarterback, your team simply has no chance of winning the Super Bowl, period. This list, of course, was inspired by the top 10 quarterback coach duos from Colin Cowherd in which you guys Gronk spiked the like button 100 plus times. I thank you for that. And now it's time for my list. All 32 combinations. Let's rock. Let's begin with the number 32 combination in the NFL. At number 32, Bryce Young and Mr. Canales. New coach Dave Canales, former Tampa Bay Buccaneer offensive coordinator, new head coach of the Carolina Panthers, and Bryce Young last season's first overall selection. And I should bring up that this list was compiled based on my collective ranking of the coach and the quarterback. I didn't make a singular ranking for this list. It's simply made up of my ranking of the quarterback plus my ranking of the coach equals the ranking on this list. Therefore, there's very little bias. So if you're a Panthers fan out there saying, hey, why are we last? Well, most of it has to do with the fact that I don't think Bryce Young was very good last year. I don't think he'll ever be very good. And I also believe that Canales is young and inexperienced. And while I do like certain aspects of both of the quarterback and the coach, collectively, they're the least experienced, least accomplished, most negative out of any combination. I like Canales' attitude. I like his communication capabilities. I think he'll be a good leader, especially on offense in the NFL. But I will say that he never proved to me that he was an elite play caller or an elite schemer or anything in that regard or that realm. He never gave me those vibes. I do think he's very good with quarterbacks in which this combination, he could help Bryce Young grow and play better at this position in 2024 and beyond. And I would expect that because that's what he's done with Geno Smith and Russell Wilson and Baker Mayfield and all the stops that he's been as a primary quarterback coach or offensive coordinator. Bryce Young, I would expect to be better with the pieces that are around him this year. I think Bryce Young is a smart player. I think Bryce Young is an accurate passer. I think Bryce Young doesn't have a great arm, but I also think that his arm strength is not to the level where it's deterring him from being a great quarterback. I think his biggest issue is his size. He is the smallest quarterback I have ever witnessed play a snap in the NFL. He is tiny in terms of his frame and his height. And it's just very hard for him to do the things that other quarterbacks can do because physically, he's one of the most least talented players at this position in the league that's starting. He truly is. Now, could he overcome that with experience? with intelligence, with knowing where to go with the ball, getting rid of it faster. He held on to it way too long last year. Can a great coach get more out of him? I certainly think that's the case because at Alabama, he showed that he had that grasp of being a playmaker and having an ideal sense for playing the position. But I also feel like he's never going to be great because he doesn't have that ceiling that some of these other guys have. 
So time will tell on Canales, but I also would not necessarily get rid of him if Bryce Young doesn't drastically improve because I just don't know if he's ever going to be anything, honestly. That's just my honest take at this position. So that's why this combination ranks as number 32. At number 31, Will Levis and Callahan. Now, I also said that the quarterback and the coach combinations were graded and given a score. The gap between number 32 and number 31 was significant, but the gap between 31 and 30 was not as significant. It was only actually one point. So there was a gap between the bottom pairing of Bryce Young and Canales of six points in terms of the grading. So they graded a 62. This combination, Levis and Callahan, graded a 56. So there is more potential here. Will Levis... I like the traits that he showcased in his rookie season. And this is exactly what I'm talking about with Bryce Young. Like Bryce Young was the first overall pick. Will Levis slipped till the second round. He was kind of like the meme. He was like the laughing stock of the draft last year with the whole mayo antics and the eating the banana backwards and upside down and the whole girlfriend situation. All that stuff turned into Will Levis becoming a bit of a memeable player. But then you watched him play, and I think he really got a lot of fans excited in Tennessee because he's ideally from a size, a stature, a toughness, a mentality, an arm strength standpoint, what you're looking for in an NFL quarterback. Now, can he grasp the mental side of the game? Can he be more accurate and detailed in his approach as a player? Time will tell. But somebody like Callahan that worked with Joe Burrow as a young player that helped him grow at that quarterback position now that he has receivers around him and offensive line improving, Callahan was a guy that spearheaded, was at the forefront of some of this new Cincinnati age. And you would hope that that would be the direction. Now, I do question Callahan in terms of being a play caller. I don't necessarily think he's going to be next level or special. I also wonder, you know, Really, like he was an odd hiring. He kind of came out of nowhere to some degree. And a lot of it was based on the late success of the Bengals last year post Joe Burrow. If Joe Burrow had played last year, I wonder if Callahan still gets a job. I, I do really wonder that. At the same time, though, his father's in the NFL. He's now working for Tennessee, one of the best offensive line coaches in the league. And Callahan may have other aspects to give other than just being a quarterback-centric guy, a play caller-centric coach, might also be pretty good with line of scrimmage aspects and things like that. You would wonder if his, his game is more versatile, his coaching is more versatile than what would appear in Cincinnati. So these two have a lot of potential, and that's why I think they're a level ahead of number 32, but there's also a lot of question marks moving forward. So that's why they're at number 31. At number 30, I've got Drake May and Gerard Mayo, my new New England Patriot duo, and I'm very excited for this combination, and I think they're going to be great. Now, that being said, they graded as a 55, right? So they were only one point ahead of Levis and Callahan, and they were seven ahead of the bottom pairing because they're both inexperienced. They're both rookies, Mayo and May. But I think that Drake May is going to be a top 10 quarterback in the NFL at some point. I also think that Gerard Mayo has the makings of being a very good coach, and he also is very similar to me, to D'Amico Ryans. Like, C.J. Stroud, Drake May, I think there's comparisons there in terms of slipping in the draft. Maybe they shouldn't have. You know, we've seen quarterbacks like Justin Herbert, C.J. Stroud, guys that I thought should have went maybe a little bit higher than they went. They, Josh Allen's another example. They slip, and they just do damage at the NFL level and pretty quickly overall. And I think Drake May could be good by like year two. I, I would probably put rookie year to be a little bit up and down roller coaster esque, but I think you're going to see flashes of great ability from this kid. I think by year two, he's going to be a really good player. I think, you know, top 20 at least. So, and then I look at Gerard Mayo. I, I like how he speaks, I like how different he is from Belichick in terms of, I think he's very. Uh, just 
calm, composed, never seems angry. He's not dull, but he, he's got some charisma to him, but he's also very businesslike. And he approaches his press conferences that way. I like how he speaks. And I feel like his experience as a player is definitely something that other players can attach to and relate to in the New England Patriot locker room. Very different from Belichick. I think he'll be less of a general, but still enough of a general to get the team in, in line and in the right way that they want to stick to the Patriot way. And Drake May, I feel, will be just dynamic from a passing athletic standpoint and seems to be driven to be great. So I'm very excited for these two. There's just only so high you can go with them because they literally have never shown us they could do this at an elite level. So I have them at number 30. At number 29, I've got Gardner Minshew and Antonio Pierce. I was higher on Pierce than Minshew in my individual rankings. And that's even considering that Pierce is only really coached for about half a year. So I'm excited for Pierce because I think he brings an attitude and a feistiness and a toughness back to the Raider nation and the Raider way. And I think he thoroughly understands, you know, growing up in Compton, being a Raider fan for his entire life, what the Raiders are about. And I thought he brought that instantly, just the attitude he had. And I think that Gardner Minshew is kind of Kenny Stabler-esque. I'm not saying he's going to be Kenny Stabler, but just in terms of the personality. They're very unique. They're very individual. They don't really care what other people think. They don't really care. You know, they're, they lead because they're just cool, laid-back dudes, and they play football, and they have fun. And I think that really meshes well with a team that's got a lot of individual talent on offense, trying to figure out how it can come together and be cohesive, and then a defense that's very tough and going to keep them in a lot of games. So I think Minshew and, and Pierce is exactly, you know, from an aura, from a from a likability standpoint, from a I want to play for them standpoint, this is like a top five or six duo in the league, in my opinion. From an actual skill and ability standpoint, I do question, obviously, Minshew. He's not the most gifted quarterback, the most gifted passer or athlete. He's a little bit smaller. Antonio Pierce. He's a guy that's never really been a great play caller. He's really a head coach in the truest sense where he's more of a motivator. He's going to, you know, get the culture on task, but he's probably not going to bring anything from a, a real, like, analytical or uh, schematic standpoint where he's going to be like the next Kyle Shanahan. So to me, at number 29, I really like the vibe of these two. I just wonder about the actual production. At number 28, Jaden Daniels and Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn ranked decently high considering he hasn't been a head coach in a while because he did take a team to the Super Bowl and his first run as a head coach was fairly successful overall. He did ultimately get let go, but at the same time, I thought he was a good coach for that team, that culture, and Matt Ryan and, and so on. I think Jaden Daniels is exciting if you're a Commanders fan. I think he's the most exciting quarterback prospect they've had since RG3 by a long shot. I also think that he's athletic, fun to watch. He's got, you know, gifted legs and uh, also seems to have a good attitude to him and very likable. I would say that I do question Jaden Daniels in terms of his size and in terms of the ability to hold up as a pocket passer in this league and be able to be as, you know, m manipulate manipulatable, I guess, in the pocket. Uh, malleable is probably the word I'm looking for, where he can kind of like create, see things, experience the pressure, maneuver, manipulate, and make a throw. Like he definitely needs to grow in that area. And I think Dan Quinn needs to prove that he has evolved since the last time he was a head coach. He's evolved as a defensive mind, as a defensive coordinator, and he will elevate Washington's defense. But the question is, from a culture standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from an understanding offense standpoint, has he elevated to deserve this chance? Because there are others that have had maybe more success individually as coordinators or potentially are younger or have more flair or excitement to them that maybe could have used this job over Quinn. But Quinn, still at the same time, he's done it. He's been successful in Dallas, so now he's got his second chance. So they're an intriguing pairing at number 28. They also, by the way, graded two points higher than Pierce and Minshew. 
At number 27, Caleb Williams and Matt Eberflus, who grade at a 48, and they're tied with actually my number 26. So these two are kind of interchangeable, but I decided to put this duo one step below the number 26 for reasons that we'll get to. Caleb Williams is extremely exciting, young quarterback, very talented, physically, mentally, charismatic. He's got the true full package to be a successful superstar player in the NFL. He's got a great arm. He can scramble. He can create. He can buy time. Now, can he stay in line? Can he stay focused on the NFL? Can he stay focused on his task to become great? Because he does seem to be a little bit out there in terms of his personality, a little bit odd, a little bit weird, whatever you may label it, you know, the, the fingernails, all that sort of stuff. Like, there, it's not necessarily those individual things that he does, but they all add up to kind of a unique kind of never seen before quarterback personality that is like, I just don't know how it's going to go in an NFL locker room when you have to lead grown men who are many years older than you. But we'll see how it goes. I do think he's very talented, and I, I think he's just got a unique sense playing the position. He sees things that nobody else sees while he's he's throwing the football and moving you know, away from pressure. Matt Eberflus is a defensive coach, so he doesn't exactly connect with Caleb Williams right away in terms of an offensive philosophy or scheme or way to get him unlocked. But Eberflus can help him by unlocking a great defense for him and helping him in terms of early in his career, not having to score too many points. So Eberflus, very different from Caleb. I kind of like this combination early on in his career because Eberflus is very old school, it feels like. He's very, in terms of football, very fundamentally sound. He, he preaches fundamentals. He preaches work ethic. You know, he is very opposite of Caleb and the new generation. So I almost feel like that is going to be very good, but it could also kind of backfire at the same time. So we'll see how it goes. But at number 27, Chicago. At number 26, the Seattle Seahawks, Geno Smith and Mike McDonald. This combination I actually really, really like. The only reason they're at number 26 is because Mike McDonald is a new coach, and so I couldn't really rank him very high on the coaching rankings. If I had ranked them where I think they actually belong, they're probably in the top fringe top 20 area. Obviously, McDonald has to kind of confirm that he's going to be a great coach, but I instantly think he's going to do some big things in the NFL from a defensive standpoint, elevating the Seahawks roster on that side. I think he's got a really good energy to him. I think that instantly players are going to be able to connect. I think that his just his energy and and his capacity to, you know, be creative and do different things with the defense and I think that they're going to have a fresh new Pete Carroll perspective in terms of a younger Pete Carroll in Mike McDonald. I also think that Gino is a great leader. I love Gino as you know, more than just the quarterback. I think he is a good downfield passer. I think from the pocket, he's pretty deadly. I think he's got a pretty good arm and, and decent accuracy overall. I think he's got a good enough athleticism. But what I really like about Gino is his off the field. He's, he's a leader for this team, inspirational in many ways. Uh, the way that he talks, it feels like everybody loves him on this team. He's learned from a lot of what he's experienced in his career. And he's grown from it. And I really respect Gino as a player. So I think this combo is going to be like very underdog-ish, very especially in that division. But I could see them really, really thriving instantly. So I'm really excited for Gino and McDonald. That feels like very good vibes in Seattle. At number 25, Derek Carr and Dennis Allen. Derek Carr and Dennis Allen don't feel like a great combination to me, but they do actually like each other dating back to the Raiders days. And Derek Carr, I think part of the reason he actually, you know, decided to go to New Orleans was because of the relationship he may have had with Dennis Allen back with the Raiders. So I do think there's something there. But, you know, in terms of their individual, I, I think that Carr has always had enough talent to be a successful player in which he's had spades of having success. But he's ne never really been able to string it together to have consistent success as a player or as a team. And Dennis Allen is, a, I think, a really above-average, good defensive play caller and schemer. But I think as a head coach, he just really fails in time management. He fails as an offensive-minded guy. He just doesn't seem to have it as a head coach. And I don't really know what the it is, but he's missing it. 
Derek Carr is the same thing. This is just the combination that individually when they're at their best and they're doing what they do best, they are good. But when they come together and they're trying to put something of a successful team together, I don't think it really will function at a high level. Just because neither of them, I think, have that like that it factor, that like extra little ingredient that puts them over the top. So uh, yeah, that's why they're at number 25 because they both ranked, you know, kind of underwhelmingly on their lists, but they're, they're individually good at certain things. At number 24, Daniel Jones and Brian Dayball, Daniel and Dayball, they both, you know, went to the playoffs together in their first season together, and they led a New York Giants team that was having some pretty horrendous football seasons in the previous years. And then this past year, obviously, Daniel Jones got injured, but it just wasn't the same. Dayball was kind of like losing track of the locker room and losing hold of the culture. And now that kind of places him on the hot seat. Daniel Jones is also very much on the hot seat. And there was rumors that Dayball and the Giants were going to actually draft a quarterback. And I think if they were able to get in a position for Drake May or maybe even Jane Daniels, they would have gotten that player uh, and pick that player, but I guess they didn't really feel like anyone else was really worth the pick. So they went with a receiver to help Daniel Jones out and Malik Neighbors. We'll see how that goes. But I like this combo in year one. I thought that Dayball did great things for Daniel. I thought he unleashed his athleticism, his legs. I thought he made his reads simple and effective. And Daniel Jones is one of those players that's very much robotic and very much if it's on a platter for him to make the play, make the throw, make the run, he's going to do it, and he can do it at a pretty high level. But when you ask him to do things beyond the system, beyond the scheme, when you ask him to read defenses consistently and put play, put the ball in really accurate and small places, he's not the best, most ideal quarterback, especially when being paid the money that he's being paid. So this is a weird combo because I think Dayball is definitely better than Daniel and Dayball kind of made Daniel what he is today in terms of like the money he makes and the, the position that we thought he may have been at. But at the same time, Daniel Jones has enough athleticism and ability to showcase that when he is in the right system, he can be effective. So it is an odd pairing there, but at number 25, I have Daniel Jones and Brian Dayball. At number 24, I think I said 25. At number 23, Kyler Murray and Jonathan Gannon. Kyler Murray and Gannon are the Cardinals pairing. And it's one of those where I think Kyler obviously has proven enough that at times he can play at an elite level as a playmaker and as an overall quarterback to go above and beyond and carry his team to success. At the same time, Jonathan Gannon is very, very, very new to this thing. He's only had a season and much of that season was without Kyler Murray, his franchise player and quarterback. I also wonder, you know, Kyler Murray has not been the best the last two years in terms of his play. I thought that last year he played better than his numbers would have suggested. I definitely felt like there were games against the Eagles, the Steelers, where he played effective football, but the box scores didn't, didn't necessarily show that. I think also at the same time, Gannon early in the season did a good job of keeping this team on track, actually making them more successful than you would have thought and not making them a laughing stock because that roster did not have any talent and was starting Josh Dobbs at quarterback. So I thought Gannon did an exceptional job early to get this team motivated and on the right track, but I think he kind of lost his way near the end of the year from a defensive standpoint. So it'll be intriguing to see how both of them come together in year number two for each other and... I think Kyler will be back to 100% at his best, and I think Gannon will definitely be interesting, but I just don't think he has enough on defense to really make a huge difference on his side of the ball, so it's going to come down to can he truly lead this team, which I don't know if he really has the aura for that. I, I don't really see him as a great speaker or a truly charismatic persona, but I do think that he is a decent coach. I, I still have a lot of questions about Gannon. At number 22, Sam Darnold and Kevin O'Connell. Sam Darnold has always had ability, and now he'll finally get the opportunity to play with a very good coach, a very good play caller, and a very good leader. I think Kevin O'Connell is probably the coach that on my coaching list I wanted to rank higher, but I didn't necessarily have any reason or factual evidence to be able to rank him higher. You know what I mean? Like, 
He's never won a playoff game, although he did go to one. He's had only like two years, but one of them was really, really good. One of them was injury riddled. But I recently was watching the wide receiver do documentary with Justin Jefferson. And there was one moment in there where O'Connell after the, I think it was the Eagles game. It was the Eagles game or it was the Chiefs game. And after that game, he was really fired up and he was going after his team. And I just really liked that. I hadn't seen that sign side from him. He also seems very much like a player's coach, like very approachable, very much like another member of the team. It does help that he's young. And I think he's very relatable in that way. I think he's also very smart. His play calling is very on cue. Uh, whenever they need a big play, it feels like he puts together a really nice game plan for that situation. And like I said, I was actually really impressed with just his his range. I didn't think he was such a uh, kind of like tough guy. But actually, when he was talking, I was actually really impressed with that side of him. So I'm really interested for Darnold to go from backup of Kyle Shanahan underneath Brock Purdy, learning there in San Francisco and having some spot play, right? Like at the end of the year against the Rams, playing against the Ravens at the end of that game. Like showing enough, like in Carolina, the last time he played, he wasn't bad. Like he wasn't that bad. They, they nearly went to the playoffs, <laughs> believe it or not. So, you know, he's always had athleticism. He could run. He has a strong arm. He's got to hone in on, you know, the, the turnovers. Um, he's got to hone in on the decision-making and the overall spraying of the football. The accuracy has got to be more kind of in line with what you would expect. And I think reading defenses, he's always a little bit struggled with. But he's got all the skill. So can a coach like O'Connell take what Shanahan was building with him and turn that into and flip that into a starting quarterback. J.J. McCarthy is another possibility here, but he's also a very young, moldable project in terms of the Minnesota situation. So either way, it's O'Connell and a young or slash moldable, potentially decent quarterback here at number 22. At number 21, basically Sean Payton and whoever. Sean Payton and Bo Nix. Bo Nix was my number 32 ranked quarterback. He is a rookie, of course, and he was the lowest drafted in the first round, if I'm not mistaken, out of all the quarterbacks. And Sean Payton is a Hall of Fame, future Hall of Fame coach that is coming off a good but not a great season, a little bit underwhelming for Broncos fans in some regard, but also pretty projectable if you were a, a fan outside of the Broncos. Broncos, just given how Russell Wilson was playing before that and the, and the talent on the team. So Sean Payton had a lot, you know, in terms of on his plate last year to really turn this into a good team. But he made them respectable. And I think a lot of people expect the Broncos to be a pretty bad team this year. If they're not going to be a bad team, it's going to come down to these two. Like Sean Payton and Bo Nix are going to have to find some sort of combination where Payton is dialing in on what Nix does well. You know, whether it be short passing, uh, rhythm passing, short RPOs or bubble screens and or using his athleticism to his advantage. I think Peyton really likes Knicks because he has a combination of things that he really likes in quarterbacks. He's a quick processor. He sees things fast. He gets the ball out quickly, mostly on time. And he does have a flair of athleticism and a bit of thickness and toughness to him. So there are some intriguing aspects to Knicks that make him a compelling fit with Sean Peyton. Sean Payton, I think, has got to maybe dial in a little bit of the aggression from a communication standpoint. He went above and beyond in ripping the previous regime before him, which I think was not very interesting or appealing to my vantage point. But I also feel like Sean Payton has the capacity to be driven uh, and extremely, extremely good as an underdog like whenever he's counted out he can come through with a big time season or a big time performance so at number 21 Sean Payton Bo Nix very interesting Nix and Payton O'Connell and Darnold were both tied at 42 so they're also interchangeable now leading in to number 20 Richardson and Steichen in Indianapolis now this is a duo to me, that has a ton of potential. And that's what the Colts scream in 2024, a team of potential. And that's because of these two. Like Steichen showed me last year that he was truly such an influential part 
of the Philadelphia Eagles. His play calling, his timely rhythm within the Jalen Hurts attack, and then that carried over to Indianapolis. No matter the quarterback he had, whether it be Richardson early or Minshew later, he seemed to find a rhythm that helped them win some football games. And he's he's a really good coach. I think he utilizes, I think, analytics well. I think he's really good at the the toughness, running the football aspect of the game. And I think he's willing to be creative, but also at the same time, his creativity is within a simple framework, if that makes sense. And then Anthony Richardson is just a freak of nature, one of the most athletic quarterbacks we've ever seen, fast, big, strong, has a great arm. If he can stay on the field, I think these two are going to tear up the NFL. I do feel like it might be a bit hit and miss in 2024, but this could be one of the league's best combinations in a young, promising division, you know, pretty quickly. Like, if Richardson can figure it out, like, he's got a lot of room to grow. He's got a lot of things to figure out, right? Timing, accuracy, rhythm, like, getting the ball out. But his athleticism is so great, he can rely on those things until he captures that. But, yeah, these two are really promising. That's why they're at number 20, because both of their... Just the glimpses we've seen from them has been so impressive that they're worthy of being ranked 20th. At number 19, I have Kirk Cousins and Raheem Morris. Morris, of course, a new head coach, but also has coached before in the NFL. Uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coach, Atlanta Falcons as well for a brief period after Dan Quinn got let go. And then Kirk Cousins, obviously a quarterback that's very good, but also is coming off an Achilles. So that hurt his ranking. So some weird things with this ranking, but I think overall there's definitely potential that they could be the best combo in this division. I think that especially when you consider the offense they'll be running, you know, under Zach Robinson coming from Los Angeles, Raheem Morris, what he's been able to do with the Rams defense, whether it be with the Super Bowl unit or the, you know, coaching up important positions on that unit when Brandon Staley was there, like linebackers or maybe even the later years where they didn't have the great talent of Vaughn Miller and Jalen Ramsey and all these guys right around Aaron Donald, they still were able to be successful as a team, and he was able to piece this defense together. So Morris, I think, is a very good uh, presence. He's very strong. He's very, I think, like firm. Um, gives you confidence in the way he speaks about things. I think that he deserved a second chance. He was a good coordinator for a number of years for that football team and was influential in them winning a Super Bowl for sure. And he also has been around so many intelligent coaches over the years from the Shanahan tree, including Sean McVay, that it's hard to pass him up. Kirk Cousins, I think he could bring the best quarterback that the Falcons have had by a lot since Matt Ryan and cousins, you know, he is the type of guy that if you're going to have a defensive coach, you want to have a quarterback like cousins who is smart, who can basically run his own offense is very particular, very detailed, very, you know, he could really help a young play caller and that young play caller can give him some new ideas and some new influence to his game. So I really like this combination entering 2024. They just do have questions about being in a new place for Cousins, coming back from injury for Cousins, and then obviously being basically a new coach. At number 18, Aaron Rodgers and Robert Sala, the combination that we never actually got to see in 2023. This one is very controversial in terms of I feel like they could butt heads at a certain point. I feel like there will be co- conflict between these two. But if it goes well, it could go really well. Like Robert Sala is kind of a different coach that Aaron Aaron Rodgers has never had a coach like Robert Sala. He's never had a defensive coach, if I'm not mistaken. And he's never had like, like a big personality tough guy persona coach he's never really had that high-flying energetic defensive big dude as a coach like he's had like Mike McCarthy Matt LaFleur that's basically it right like he's had the offensive guys 
He's had like the big, you know, the fat guy, di- the fat guy, right? Or the the kind of like nerdier, um, young, flashy coach. He's had those two things. He's never really had the defense of I'm gonna go bench press with my defensive lineman and then I'm gonna run up the steps and then I'm gonna go smash my face against the wall. Yeah. Um, but Robert Sala and Rogers make for a compelling combo because of that, because Rogers is very, especially at this point, he's very individual on offense. He's going to be very much to his own. Uh, he is very, I think his own personality. Um, but he's also, I think very analytical, very detailed, very particular, very nuanced in the way that he wants things done. And so having a defensive guy is almost kind of like a breath of fresh air for Rodgers because he doesn't have to worry about other cooks in the kitchen of what he's trying to cook up on offense. So it's kind of an interesting dilemma. But at number 18, I kind of like this combo. I could also see it backfiring. At number 17, I got Baker and Bowles. And this one is a really funny one because I feel like Todd Bowles is very relaxed. He's very calm. He's very, ah, shucks. You know, like that's Todd Bowles to me. Like he is tough. His identity is aggressive on defense. Like he definitely is old school. But at the same time, he's very like just relaxed, right? Arians was a little bit more crazy and all over the place. And I think Bowles kind of calmed him and chilled him out a little bit. Uh, But Baker Mayfield is kind of like the Arians for Todd Bowles now. Like, Baker is very, like, not crazy, but he he's very, he's a personality. Like, he's got a big heart. He's got a big personality. He's got, uh, you know, a big smile on his face all the time. He's always trying to have fun. Players around him really, you know, gather around him and want to play for him. And I think that makes for a very compelling and different combination where you've got a defensive guy that, although his defensive mentality is aggressive, he is very, he's very composed and calm. You don't really know what he's thinking. And for Baker, it's like the opposite. He's very emotional. And I think that is very, a very good mix for Tampa Bay. Plus their, their names, Baker and Bulls, some good alliteration there at number 17. At number 16, Watson and Stefanski, the Cleveland combo. Now, this one is also one that we haven't seen much of. And this is mostly based on that I have Stefanski in my top 10. And Watson is a tier above the bottom quarterbacks in the league. And, you know, Baker and Bulls, I actually think are the better combo if you actually were to individually rank them as a combination, Uh, but in terms of the the actual ranking at which I'm going for here, Stefanski and Watson graded a 33, Baker and Bulls a 38, Sala and Rogers 39, Morris and Kirk 39. So actually they're a little bit of a head in terms of their ranking here. But, you know, Watson and Stefanski, I, I could see this really working out. I think the thing I will say and why they're 16 above the other rankings, they've got a lot of potential. Stefanski has shown that with Lesser quarterback talents, he has done big-time things. Baker Mayfield, Joe Flacco, right? He's been able to, Jacoby, to a certain extent, he's been able to get some of the best football out of those players in kind of weird times. Also, I feel like Deshaun Watson, you know, he needs, the thing with him is like, he needs a guy that is like understanding and a guy that's not going to be too judgmental and a guy that's not going to jump down his throat. But at the same time, he does need sort of like an offensive coach and a guy that's going to be a little bit hard on him. So I think Stefanski is maybe a little bit too soft on Watson. I'm not I'm not 100% sure, but that's just the vibe he gives. But at the same time, I think he's very nurturing. I think Stefanski is very much a teacher. So... It comes down to whether or not Deshaun Watson is going to want to take to that teaching and want to grow back to the player he was and beyond. Uh, But they they have a lot of potential as a pairing. And they even showed last year that despite Watson not playing well really individually, that they were still able to win. I think they were like 5-1 and last year. So, uh, yeah, at number 16. At number 15, Jalen Hurts and 
Sirianni, everybody's most punchable face in the NFL, with, to be honest, you know, kind of the opposite in Jalen Hurts. I mean, the only reason you might hate Jalen Hurts is because the guy's handsome. I don't know what else you would really hate about him. Like, Jalen Hurts feels like a guy that everybody should like. Like, he's he's a stand-up guy. He, he works hard. He's worked for everything he's gotten. He had to transfer in college. He improved his game. He really grind, you know, through the, the, the rough and was able to come out on top. Uh, but Hurts is a beast, man. He, he can run. He, he could throw. He, in big games, he's shown up. In big moments, he's shown up. And he's a, he's a good leader and ambassador for Philadelphia football. He is actually a lot more classy than uh, Philadelphia Eagles teams are known for. Uh, and it's actually kind of Donovan McNabb-esque in, in some ways. Uh, I also feel like Nick Sirianni is what Philadelphia is. It's kind of a weird dynamic. Hertz is classy and composed. Well, that's typically the coach. For Philadelphia, it's the opposite. The arrogant, stuck-up, no-good ass is actually Nick Sirianni, who at times that works for him, but at other times it doesn't. Uh, so it is actually really weird. The two sides of Philadelphia, the underdog and the the dick, I guess. But yeah, Sirianni and Hurts, a really interesting combo that has been to a Super Bowl. Right, but again, I'm just ranking this based off my collective ranking, and and Sirianni was a lot lower than Hertz. Hertz was borderline top ten, while Sirianni did not rank as high. So that's why they're at 15. I think based on accomplishment, they might be a bit higher, but just based on my individual ranking, which I again was very unbiased, they're at number 15. At number 14, I've got Trevor Lawrence and Doug Peterson. Okay. They graded at a 27 while Hertz and Sirianni were at a 30. Watson and Stefanski, 33. So there's been a three-point separation here. We're going to get a little bit closer in the next couple of entries. But Lawrence and Doug are interesting. I really like this combination, especially this year. I think Doug Peterson, at his best, is one of the best coaches in the league. I think that there's certain moments where Doug Peterson is just vibing. Like Doug Peterson is very much a vibe coach. I think he would be great to play for. I think he would, he's very much a player's coach. Uh, and he's obviously an offensive guy. He's very risk risky, but he's also plays that into like the mentality, into into the way the team is structured and characterized. And to me, Trevor Lawrence is very like laid back and almost like Nick Foles-esque, like very Ah, oh, whatever. It's fourth down. We're going to go for it. Okay, let's do it. Like Trevor, though, he's like a beast of an athlete. He's always had high expectations. He's always been first in, in everything. And Doug Peterson has always been a bit of an underdog. So it's a kind of a compelling combination here between the two. Um, I'm intrigued to see this season ahead of them because year one was successful. They go to the playoffs. They win a playoff game in dramatic fashion. Then, you know, year two, they were starting off very well. It looked like they were going back to the playoffs, despite me not really thinking they were going to be that good. And then they eventually fall off, and that's probably because Lawrence got hurt, but then other aspects. So can Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence get this thing back on track? Lawrence was just paid a lot of money, so he's going to have high expectations. So, yeah, I think a very solid offensive-driven combo that has a lot of potential that has been untapped at number 14. At number 13, Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy. Uh, as Colin Cowherd said, this is the only combo to win 12 games, I believe, three years in a row, which I think not even Reed and Mahomes have been able to accomplish that. So that's definitely under the great stuff that they've done. Individually, Dak I have as the higher individual than Mike McCarthy. McCarthy, I think, is a pretty average coach, maybe a slightly below average head coach. While Dak Prescott is above average for sure, he's probably in the top 10 somewhere at the bottom of the top 10. So Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy. Uh, McCarthy does have a ring, and some people bring that up, but it's been a long time and a lot of disappointment since that ring. Like, remember how many times the Packers were expected to do big things with Aaron Rodgers and they really fell short? You think back to the absolute blowing it against the Seahawks in 2014, upset against the Giants in 2011, numerous losses to the 49ers, 
Um, the, you know, like just bad outings in the, in the playoffs. Uh, but some of that was Aaron, on Aaron Rodgers as well. Dak Prescott kind of still has that same sauce all over him, bro. Like Dak's got to prove it in the playoffs, in the big games, in the big show. And McCarthy's got to be, I think, better in that setting. Like, he was terrible against the Packers. He didn't have his team ready against the Packers. And you would think any team that he'd be ready for would be the former team that fired him. But I guess not. And, yeah, I don't have much else to say other than Dak's good. McCarthy, I don't know. He's the one that's on the hot seat. But Dak, at the same time, like, is he really worth all this money? So, yeah. At number 13, I've got the Cowboys combo. At number 12, Russell Wilson and Mike Tomlin. This is probably a surprise entry this high, but this was the collective ranking, guys. Uh, you know, at 25, one point ahead of Dak and McCarthy and two points ahead of T-Law and Peterson. Russell Wilson ranked, I think, as the 21st best quarterback and Tomlin was the fourth best coach. So this is obviously a Tomlin-driven ranking, but that honestly makes a lot of sense. There is also, I think, potential in this combo that a lot of people are not giving it credit for. I think at any time, Russell Wilson, I'm not saying he's going to turn into 2017 Russ overnight, but could he be, once again, a 32-touchdown passer and a 10-pick thrower? I think he could do that. I mean, he wasn't far off last year, and I think this is the type of combo that I just think they're so synchronized. They're, they're so meant for each other, in my opinion. Like, Russ is... He's free-willing, free-wheeling. He's, he's a backyard player. He's really, really driven. He's really fun at some moments to watch, but he's also very, like, straight and narrow, very, like, straight-edged, and Mike Tomlin is almost the same. Like, if you told me Mike Tomlin was Russell Wilson's older brother... I, like, wouldn't be shocked. Like, they seem to have the same sort of, like, upbringing, like, strict sort of, like, nature to their being. Like, it's kind of a weird description. But Russ has always been good with defensive coaches. I think he saw a, a, a confliction with Sean Payton because Payton is an offensive guy that wants to play by the book and wants to play through his scheme and wants to play to... One to two to three to, you know, do this, check this. You know, at the line, we've got these two plays. You can go to this. Russ is just like, give me the play. I want to do this. I'm going to run around. We're going to throw, a you know, an absolute rainbow ball into the the basket of Tyler Lockett for a 60-yard gain. And he's going to he's gonna be smart with the ball. He's going to want to play through the defense. You know, he's going to want to run a lot of play action. Like, these two seem to have the same sort of energy to me. And I think especially with with uh, Russell Wilson, where he's playing for cheap, he's trying to prove himself, he's got a chip on his shoulder. Mike Tomlin is a guy that I think, you know, has been a great coach for a long time. Everybody talks about the no-losing seasons, the consistency, the ability to build a culture, to keep that culture together, to never, you know, have any sort of problems in the locker room. Everybody respects him, loves him, adores him. And it's been a while since he's had success in the playoffs. So can these two come together at a very important part of their career and catapult themselves in a direction where they can make a statement? That'll be interesting for the Steelers. But at number 20, or at number 12, I've got Russ and Tomlin with a 25 grading. At number 11, just saw outside of my top 10, Tua and McDaniel. One of the, like, from a persona standpoint, one of the weirdest clashes of humans in the NFL. And and honestly, I've ever seen. Like, Tua is a kind of a weird guy. I, I, I don't, he's, he's a fine quarterback, but he is just odd. I, I don't know. He's just odd. He's just like, uh, it's Tua, you know, like, he's just, I don't know how to describe the guy, honestly, like. He's just like, oh, oh, shucks, you know, like, uh, I'm Tua, what's going on? And then you've got McDaniel, who's like the most gangster nerd you've ever seen. Like, he is a weird mix of, a, a you know, glasses and rap music, right? Like, 
I don't know the con- the combo is odd. It's almost like McDaniel is more of like a a badass than Tua is, and it, it almost feels like that shouldn't be the case. Uh, but when they come together on the football field, I think they reach an understanding from an analytical, um, intellectual standpoint where they're both very quick minded. I think McDaniel is very creative, certainly. And that's the forefront of the team and the offense and the identity of the team. And Tua does a good job of taking in all that information and all of that creativity and honing in on it and doing a great job of being the distributor of the offense. And I don't think Tua gets enough credit for that. So at number 11, one of the weirdest clashes of personalities, but also when they come together on the field, very intellectual pairing between Tua and McDaniel. And McDaniel has really made Tua into the quarterback I think that he's become. Entering the top 10, the unproven but extremely exciting combination of Herbert and Harbaugh, which Colin Coward at at number four. I thought that was outrageously high. But again, I'm just ranking it based on the the combo ranking. And I had Harbaugh somewhere in the middle, I think like 15. And I had Herbert at like six. So they graded at a 21, which by the way, the next three entries are all tied with a 21 grade and slightly elevated from Tua and McDaniel at 23. So these next three are all interchangeable based on the grade that I gave them in the collective. But Herbert and Harbaugh are exciting because, and I've I've explained this many times from my vantage point of why I like it. Because Herbert is a robot. Herbert, you know, he's very, very... To himself, you don't hear anything about Justin Herbert in the offseason. You don't see him at a big fight. You don't see him, you know, around the paparazzi. He's not making news or anything. You don't barely see him on a commercial or you don't barely see him on a, you know, a Bleacher Report video talking about his favorite play like Jordan Love or you don't see him, you know, on a podcast. Like, that's not Justin Herbert. He's probably like fishing or hunting or doing something. While Harbaugh probably does the same thing in the offseason, but both of them are all about football. They're 100% football junkies, football nerds, but they're totally different in how they approach it. Herbert is very quiet, very driven in terms of his, his particulars and how he's throwing the ball, his accuracy, you know, his timing. Um, he's, got a, he's, he's very athletic, and he's almost like a... He's almost like a a country kid that's just a wicked thrower of a ball and he has fun doing it, but he's like really driven. And then at the same time, you've got Harbaugh who's like really crazy, like outlandish, like a high school coach in many ways, like a former quarterback who just has so much emotion, wears his emotion on his sleeve, jumping up and down on the sidelines, ridiculous passion. And I think that is a guy that really needs to, be there for Herbert because Herbert is not that type of personality, not that type of leader, not the guy that's going to get everybody around him and fire them up. That's Harbaugh. So that's where this combination comes together and becomes a top 10 combo. At number nine, Jared Goff and Dan Campbell, who again, ranked at a 21. And I think this is an example of a combo that individually is lesser than the togetherness I think that Goff and Campbell are actually better when they're together than apart. I think there's something about Goff where he's very laid back. He's very composed. He's very, I think, just likable for everybody around him. While Dan Campbell is probably the opposite. He's very frantic. He's very emotional. He is similar to Harbaugh. This is similar to Harbaugh and Herbert to a certain degree. But I also feel like Campbell and Goff are like, I think Campbell is very like open about how he feels about people. He's very encouraging for somebody like Jared Goff. And I think what made this relationship so great was when Jared Goff went to Detroit, he had no confidence. I mean, Sean McVay basically threw him under the bus. The Rams kind of gave up on him. He was the first overall pick. He went to a Super Bowl. And then all of a sudden they gave up on him. And Dan Campbell was one of the only personalities to kind of like take a Jared Goff and just get him to the level that he's become, like the best version of Jared Goff we've ever seen, where he's becoming more of a leader. He's becoming, you know, more of a a technician. 
And Campbell was inspiring confidence in that player. So I think it's it's a really good combination. The, Goff gives them the composure. Campbell gives them the emotion. At number eight, C.J. Stroud and D'Amico Ryans. I think both of these two guys, while I've kind of talked about how a lot of combinations are almost opposite, this combination is very, I think, similar. I think that D'Amico is a little bit more of an old school soul. He's a little bit more uh, just, I think, like tough. Uh, but Stroud is is very kind of, I think he's got a weird mix of like an old school quarterback mentality where he's very driven and he has no excuses for anything, but he's also like very flamboyant and fun and a vibe. And D'Amico is also very like emotional and, and very kind of like, uh, you know, as a leader, he's very vocal and very just crisp with it. But he, these two kind of come together in some sort of weird space of like D'Amico kind of brings that tough former linebacker vibe and Stroud has got almost like a, like a baller, like a basketball, like I'm going to hit a three on your face or like dunk on you type vibe. But like they come together and it's like a very good combination of those two things that are almost the same, but they're slightly different. So yeah, I, I like this. I like this combination because it's a defensive guy. It's an offensive guy. And they're both like the flamboyant natures of both of those sides. And they come together at number eight. At number seven, Jordan Love and Matt LaFleur. This grading was actually way higher than I would have expected at 16. Now, this is because both of these guys, LaFleur ranked as the sixth best coach in the league. And Jordan Love ranked as the 10th best quarterback. So, you know, Lions fans are probably going to be upset. But honestly, if I were to be honest and I were to say, okay, Mitch, who would you want entering 2024? Would you want Jordan Love and Matt LaFleur? Or would you want Dan Campbell and Jared Goff? I'd probably say Jordan Love and Matt LaFleur. But I would also say the Lions are a more talented team. So just to put that out there for the Lions, like it's a it's a team versus quarterback coach combo thing. And this is why I think LaFleur and Love have so much potential down the road. Uh, and... You know, I, I like to see Jordan Love on the BR there. That was that was cool. If you guys haven't seen it, Jordan Love made a video with Bleacher Report. And he, he did like w who would be in his, kind of like CJ Stroud did, where it's like the personnel, the play, like if the game was on the line, what play would you go to? Which players would you have on your team? Your favorite play sort of thing. Uh, it was cool to see Love out there a little bit more than usual because I think what I've really admired about Love is that he's kept to himself and he hasn't kind of stolen the spotlight from the typical quarterback Packer kind of like regime of like Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre, very like, very much in the spotlight, those two guys, um, for sure. Jordan Love has been more laid back. He's very more laid back as a personality. He just got married. Uh, Matt LaFleur is kind of similar, but also like Matt LaFleur, I think, He's starting to kind of come out of his shell, I think, a little bit more this past season as a coach because he didn't have Aaron Rodgers there to judge him and kind of put him in a box. Um, and I think he almost showed more of his leadership side, more of his toughness, um, more of his ability to lead an entire team. And I think he's also a little bit of an arrogant play caller, uh, which also Shanahan and McVay have in their bag as well. But he definitely has that side to him. And I think they're both young in their heart and their mentality. Obviously, Love is, is younger than, than LaFleur, but they're both young in their professions. And I think they come together in a, in a, in a young spirit uh, that brings a new life and ex electricity to the Packers. So I'm very excited for this offensive combination. Love's ability to complete all the passes, the crossers, you know, go above and beyond with his off-platform throws and deliveries uh, within the Matt LaFleur structure of the motion and the play action. So at number seven, I have the Packers combo. At number six, Joshua Allen and Sean McDermott. By the way, shout out to Josh Allen for being one of the best athletes on earth. Uh, if you haven't seen it, he's like golfing, hitting crazy golf shots, hitting like 40, I don't know, like 30 foot basketball three-pointers. And then, you know, doing everything, that guy. But, yeah, so Josh Allen has definitely been carrying 
Sean McDermott to a certain degree, but I also feel like Sean McDermott, as I've spoken about before, is very good on defense. I think that this was an early Sean McDermott show. When Sean McDermott got to town, he, he kind of resurrected the Buffalo Bills franchise, made them relevant, made them competitive, made them tough, um, made them more of a smart team on defense and offense and analytically. I think this front office is excellent as well. And then they brought in Josh Allen and they just plugged in an absolute freak of nature into one of the most sound operations from front to back in the NFL. And they combined that with, it was weird because they, early in Allen's career, you might recall, like McDermott was almost angry at how reckless Allen was because McDermott is very defensive and he couldn't really handle that Allen was so reckless, but it's almost become to embrace Allen's side of recklessness to get the best out of Josh Allen. And that's one of the best players in the league. And, you know, that's, that's where you have to give, you know, McDermott the nod to say that's a good job on him to kind of... In, endorse and embrace the side of Josh Allen that's maybe a little bit more diversive. So diver diversive, divisive, I found the word eventually. At number six, I got Josh Allen and McDermott. A lot of success, certainly. McDermott's ranking holds back Allen as Allen was my number two quarterback. I think McDermott was my number 12 or 13 coach. So ultimately, they graded a 15, only one spot ahead of LaFleur and Love, but they're only one point below my number five pairing as well. So they're very close. I think if they would have accomplished maybe a bit more in the playoffs, they'd probably be a bit higher. At number five, Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor. Now, Zach Taylor was one that was just outside my top 10 while Joe Burrow was number three. So number 11, number three, which added up to 14, one point ahead of Allen, two ahead of LaFleur and Love. This combo has obviously been to the Super Bowl, multiple AFC championships. I think that obviously Taylor has... So this is one where it's a little bit more McDermott and Allen in terms of like, so we, I think most people associate the success of Buffalo and the Bengals with that quarterback. While I feel like the guys ahead on this list, like the duos ahead on this list, it's almost even or it's more coach oriented. I would say that. So that is where I think Burrow and Taylor, Allen, McDermott, maybe lose some points because the, the quarterback is more responsible in many people's eyes, and I think correctly so, than the coach. But speaking of Taylor, he's an offensive guy. He's morphed and you know maligned his system to put it in line with what Joe Burrow wants. And that's all you can ask for from a coach. On top of that, I think he's done a very good job in the playoffs. I think his teams have always been ready to play. And I've never watched a Bengals game in a big game where I've been like, they've been totally outcoached, totally outprepared, and they don't know what they're doing. So that speaks to Zach Taylor, right? That I have seen that with McDermott. So at number five, Burrow and Taylor. At number four, Purdy and Kyle. Kyle Shanahan, Brock Purdy did not make Colin Cowherd's top 10 for some absurd reason, but this is Kyle Shanahan's best quarterback he has ever had in his 49er tenure and I think it could be the best quarterback he's ever had eventually I'm not saying that he's ahead of Matt Ryan just yet but it could happen uh, Brock Purdy what I love about him and Kyle is I think they're both absolute killers in a way they're both very 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 uh, almost like emotionless sometimes but very driven very football is life. Uh, they're both kind of nerds and they're both like almost too, they need to loosen up. Like they're very uh, tight, I think. But that's what makes them excellent, right? Like Kyle is, he's so tight because he's, he's so detailed. He's so angle this, right? Routes got to be like that. He's so precise. He's so on it, right? And then Purdy is very much the same, which is why I feel like Purdy is so successful with Kyle. Jimmy was a lot more like loose. He got it. He was smart enough. He had the feel to get it. But like Purdy is to the next level of where he like his whole brain is open. Like you can call anything for Brock Purdy and Kyle. Kyle can teach anything to Purdy and Purdy will like not only get it, 
but he'll embrace it and understand it and get to the next level of it. And then on top of that, he's more of like a gamer. Like he not only can he grasp any everything Kyle's teaching him, but he's also very much a gamer. He's very much like, like he can run around, scramble, like extend plays, do his thing. And, and that also helps Kyle on the moments where he's not doing his best, right? And, and Kyle's, you know, a great coach. So these two are phenomenal. They've had a lot of success so far. And, you know, they've only lost like four out of like 24 games that they've had together. So uh, extremely impressive resume so far. They've been to a Super Bowl. And really when you think of what Kyle has done in terms of like who he's lost to, like a lot of people give him flack for losing in, in the Super Bowl. But you look at his playoff record, he almost has as many wins, if not more, than his dad already. And his dad had two rings, right? But Kyle, he's lost to Mahomes twice. He's lost to the Super Bowl champs once in the Rams. And he lost to Brady as a coordinator. Like, okay, it is what it is. At number three, Stafford and McVay. Uh, Stafford and McVay, they just have more of a... They're only one point ahead of Kyle and Purdy. Kyle and Purdy, 11 McVeigh and Stafford 10, which makes sense. Stafford's ranking was just a couple spots higher than Purdy, while McVeigh was only one spot lower than Kyle, which ultimately allowed us to get to number three. But this does make sense to me because they did win a Super Bowl together, and I think at their best, they are as good of a pairing as really anybody, really. I mean, like McVeigh is at times the best coach in the league. From an all-around standpoint, McVeigh is... A great coach like he's schematically one of the better coaches his offense is always at the forefront he's a very rhythm based coordinator and play caller and when he's on his game he is really tough to stop and when Stafford is honed in and throwing the football and ripping the ball from the pocket there's few that can stop him and there's few that are better so you really think about that combination like they do have their flaws they're, they're not quite perfect McVeigh could be better of a game manager, better at timeouts, things like that. Uh, he's a little emotional, but that also is a great aspect of his personality. He is he is a very good leader in terms of he's a very good communicator. Uh, he's he's got very good like a weird thing to say, but he's he's got very good body language. Like he like in terms of he's got it. Like just the all around persona of a coach, he's got it. And at the same time, Stafford he has flaws too. Like. He's, he's very laid back, but at the same time, he, he can be a little bit too aggressive. Like, he's got to be honed in. Obviously, he's not exactly the most athletic any longer. So, at number three, Stafford and McVay, very few flaws to them. Greatness is great. They just, at times, there's, there's small things that nitpick them at number three. At number two, Lamar and Harbaugh, which just get one point ahead of McVay and Stafford and two points ahead of Kyle and Purdy. With a nine uh, at number two. And this, you know, to, to explain their success, I would say that Lamar, as the starter with the Ravens, with Harbaugh as his coach, has the second best win percentage in the NFL, only behind Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. And so that would make sense why they're number two. At the same time, they both have been together for two number one seeded AFC seasons, which is very hard to do, especially in the AFC. They've had a lot of success. And basically every time that Lamar has been healthy, they've been to the playoffs and they've had more longevity and more long-term nature to their, to their success than let's say McVeigh or Stafford or Purdy or Kyle. And also Lamar has had a lot of individual success. So despite the playoff success, they're great individually and together. Um, Harbaugh had to embrace Lamar while Lamar has also had to bail out Harbaugh at times. So it works together cohesively. Um, I, I wish Harbaugh would embrace Lamar a little bit more to making this really an offensive juggernaut of a team. I do feel like there's something holding them back from that. But the thing about Harbaugh that he always has embraced is he importance of special teams, importance of defense, and has stuck to what made the Ravens great at their best, which has always been defense and running game and all that stuff. So it's an interesting clash of very charismatic uh, character in Lamar who is, is very fun, um, almost like a, ch a childlike kind of like fun to him. While Harbaugh, he's got a little bit of a, a Jim Dick side to him, but he's also like kind of like dad energy in a way. Like, But yeah, at number two, I got Harbaugh and Lamar. 
And obviously my number one is Mahomes and Andy Reid. They only had a two, which was seven points higher than my number two because both of them ranked as the number one at their corresponding spots. So yeah, there's nothing really to say here. They've won three Super Bowls. They've been to four Super Bowls. And if not for Tom Brady, they might have five Super Bowls. I've never really thought about that, but that's probably true. So yeah, we'll see if they can continue it. But I think what makes them so good is I think they're, honestly, I think they're very much the same. I think Bill and Brady were that way as well to a certain degree. Uh, Brady was just, you know, more of a, he's just like more of a, a superhero, right? Like almost like you couldn't believe how perfect the guy was while Belichick was more of the, uh, the arch enemy of the superhero, but they were very similar. Um, Mahomes and Reed are very similar. They're both like vibes to me. Like Reed is very, I think he's very laid back. He's very also like composed and he's very smart. He's also very creative and that all comes through in his play calling and his offensive design. And he's willing to listen to his players. I think he's very much a player's coach. And I think Mahomes is very much the same in terms of like, they're, they're both very creative in terms of how Mahomes plays and how Reed calls the game and how Reed kind of thinks it and Mahomes performs it. I think Mahomes is very loose as a player. You never sense tension. I think Reed is the same in his persona and how he speaks and how he talks. I think that Mahomes is also very fiery though, which is maybe something that Reed doesn't exactly exude, but I'm sure he has it. Uh, I also think that Mahomes is a little bit tougher than he maybe gives gets credit for, while Reed, I definitely think, is a little bit old school in some areas. So they, they come together in a, a very kind of cohesive manner. So I think that's what makes them great. Obviously, we know how good they are as individuals. The play caller that Reed is, the coach that Reed is, and what he's done with other quarterbacks, but then what Mahomes has allowed him to become. So, yeah. My coach quarterback duos. Every single one, ranked from 32 to 1. This was actually a really fun list to reflect on and talk about. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. It's Mitch. Peace.